pause you with our first speaker. Our first speaker is Sarah Sonner from Macaulay Youth. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much all for coming out today. Um, before I begin my speech, I want to say that I will quite liberally refer to myself as the youth of today. However, I don't know how much longer that will stand. Um, but I am speaking on behalf of the company, after all. So, today on my drive to campus, I was listening to the song Alternative Ulster by Stiff Little Fingers, a song that most of us, I'm sure, need no introduction. However, for those not familiar with it, a classic punk song detailing the struggles of the youth in Belfast and beyond. The lead singer Jake Byrne says it details the frustration of young people about the sheer tedium of having nowhere to go and nothing to do when you got there. How striking is it that a song from 1978 still is as pertinent today as it was then? One of the key lines that stuck out to me this morning is, they say they're a part of you, but that's not true, you know. And that strikes me today where a panel of so-called guarantors of peace will try and cement themselves as the architects of our peace, future and prospects. We as young people, students and workers, who are the key stakeholders in the future, need to stand up and refuse to accept the lies and manipulations from politicians, the media and institutions such as this university. I am sick of being told that we need to act friendly and diplomatically, that a selfie with whichever rich American of the week it is is progress. Our struggles and aims will not be achieved by exclusive panel discussions and committees of the bourgeoisie. The Good Friday Agreement and these events surrounding it are prime examples of how the ruling class will centre themselves in discussions on issues that affect the working class and then pat themselves on the back in congratulations. Job well done everyone and they hop back on their private jets, home to their mansions and then the rest of us are left to rot. I am also sick of being told that since I wasn't there and I didn't experience the conflict that my opinions don't matter. Well, how often have the political and economic elite put themselves in our shoes and seen it from our perspective? I was born one year before the agreement was signed, so I'll hold my hands up and say that my first-hand experience is limited. However, what I can say, I've lived 26 years of observing poverty, homelessness, my peers emigrating or taking their own lives, sectarianism fostered and allowed to grow for the benefit of the state, to stop a young Republican who grew up in a Catholic community like myself from looking over the peace walls, or the so-called peace walls, that divide us to realise that the working class Protestants from the other side experience the exact same issues as us. These walls teach us plenty about the alleged progress of the North in the past 25 years. In the early 1990s, there were 18, and in 2017, they recorded 97 separate structures, which were bigger and taller than ever before. A ceasefire doesn't mean the end to violence, be it state-mandated military and police violence, the paramilitary violence that didn't end with a piece of paper, or the systematic, uh, uh, the systematic violence of austerity and class conflict. Since 2018, the number of people in the North who have died by suicide has surpassed the deaths during the conflict. 16% of individuals live in relative poverty with 12% in absolute poverty. Homelessness continued to surge while slumlord politicians profit. It is unbelievably insensitive that those in their ivory towers would look down at us and ask why aren't we celebrating. It is insulting to us to have this panel hosted today at Queen's with a lineup of war criminals and arbiters of class divide and financial crisis. How can Bill Clinton speak about peace when his administration's actions in Kosovo, Iraq and Palestine show no regard for it? How can Tony Blair even show his face at a peace event where he oversaw over 100,000 deaths of civilians in Iraq and his recent knighthood garnered a permission to block it which surpassed one million signatures? How can Bertie Ahern stand up in front of young people and talk about their futures when he destroyed the prospects of so many already during his term and then left to fight in we were left to fight in an economic crisis while he lined his own pockets. And finally, how can Hillary Clinton be Chancellor of this university and chair this event with her destructive political past? A neoliberal and a capitalist who is Secretary of State worked alongside Obama and Biden to destabilize, destroy and drone strike the, military, the Middle East. The blockade in Cuba persists, as does the occupation of Palestine. US military jets refueled fuel in Shannon None of these panellists can talk about peace while war profiteering elsewhere. I am aware that there will be many today who roll their eyes watching our action, but I am telling you to pull that wool back from your eyes. 
Far too often young people are disregarded for being del delusional. Well, if you think the current state of the North is worth celebrating, I'm afraid you're the one who's delusional. The government cannot sit in a room together, never mind bring an, ed bring an end to these issues. It has been years si since decriminalization and we are still awaiting widespread safe local access to abortion. And just yesterday, the police protected a transphobic and fascist event on our very streets. How can we expect the youth of the North to feel any way hopeful or excited about their future? We are telling you time and time again, we are for the peace, but against the process. Forgive us for not celebrating, as today, many of our demands are unmet. And as James Connolly once said, our demands must moderate or we only want the earth. Graham Wigan. <laughs> Comrade, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak here today. I come here as a Cuban woman who's lived off the false road for 25 years. So I know pretty well what imperialism looks like. And imperialism looks like white, whitewashing crimes against humanity. And that's what we're having here today. I also come here today to tell you an American horror story that starts on the 6th of April, 1960, when a guy called Lester Mallory wrote a memorandum to his superiors in the inter-American affairs, saying that the only way to defeat, to um, gain ground in the new revolutionary Cuba was by hunger and desperation. So those are the bones of the American government fascist policy against my country. To make us bow, to make us give up on our emancipatory social justice process and leave everything that we've achieved behind and just do what they tell us, otherwise they're going to make us go hungry and desperate. A year later, on the 15th of April 1961, um, an army trained and financed by the United States government, the Kennedy government at that time, bombed a few airports in Cuba so that they could weaken us by, via air. And on the 17th, so 62 years today, on the 17th, on the 17th of April, 1961, they came um, through land. They invaded us through land. Their American intelligent was not intelligent at all. They were told that the Cuban people were going to join them. They didn't. They joined Fidel and the revolution. And we outed them. We, we smashed them in less than 72 hours. So... That is what you uh, normally know as the Bay of Pigs, and I know as Playa Giron. So today I'm here to remind them over there that we defeated imperialism in Cuba, and we will continue to do so. And back home, we are really big on hopeful chance. So I just want you to get with me on this one and it goes imperialism you're gonna fall you're gonna fall you're gonna fall and we're gonna live to see you rot imperialism you're gonna fall you're gonna fall you're gonna fall and we're gonna get to see you rot imperialism you're gonna fall you're gonna fall you're gonna fall and we're gonna get to see you rot imperialism you're gonna fall you're gonna fall you're gonna fall and we're gonna get to see you rot on block Cuba, 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 block Cuba. <laughs> exactly. Um, the other thing is that these guys here are telling us that they know a lot about democracy. But um, I, I seen a video the other day of an activist, you know, asking um, Bill. I'm the one that kills Clinton in, in town about um, the lifting of the blockade of Cuba. And Clinton just lying to his face, saying that he actually almost got it off, got it lifted. And it was, it's a blatant lie. 
Under the Clinton administration, the, the Helms Burden Law was passed, and that law meant that the blockade then was taken to every corner of this planet. So the Cuban government, the Cuban people, the Cubans living inside of Cuba, the Cubans living outside of Cuba, all Cuban people in this planet got to be um, persecuted economically. If you were to send money to Cuba, your account could be blo blocked. Uh, you would be interrogated by the, um, the um, security of the bank. And many a times the, 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 the money hasn't reached. In Cuban hands. So Clinton, you're a liar. You did not leave the blockade of Cuba. You did not almost lift it. You implemented the Helms Burden Law that strangled and strengthened the blockade. That's what he did. And I just wanted to leave that clear for the people of Belfast that saw that video. Do not fall for Clinton's lies. They're all a bunch of liars. Thank you so much. My name is Andrew Rogers and I'm an organizer and member of La Ciudad here in Belfast. There are many people here today from a number of different organizations and some from none. And we've all been brought together with a singular purpose, to highlight the peace washing of war criminals and to state that those war criminals, the guiding hands of global imperialism, along with many others, are not welcome here in Ireland. As we stand here, holed up in that building behind us, there are two senior members of the United States of America's imperialist war machine, Hillary and Bill Clinton. The former, a U.S. presidential candidate and former Secretary of State, and the latter, a former president of that same global empire. Between them, they have personally stood over the extraction of resources and capital from nation states across this earth, overseeing the imposition of the American petrol dollar and foisting of capitalist economics on unwilling peoples through the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Alongside many other war crimes, in the same year as the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, Bill Clinton both bombed Afghanistan and Sudan, it said, ending almost half the country's medicines production in one of the poorest nations in the world, whilst overseeing U.S. imperialist objectives. In 2002, Hillary Clinton, then Senator for New York, gave her support to the U.S. invasion of Iraq, a decision based on lies that caused hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of lives. The Clintons, alongside many other participants in the global imperialist cabal, are here to take part in an event that marked 25 years since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. They are here to be paraded in front of us as modern day St. Patrick's who drove violence from Ireland in 1998. What irony is this, the two individuals who delivered death and destruction across the globe via the weapons of war should be assembled before us in all their pomp, ceremony and garb of the institutions of the state as a part of a supposed process of peace. This so-called peace is being utilized by the institutions of state to wash away the sins of Hillary and Bill Clinton. What are we witnessing in peace washing and what exactly do we mean by peace washing? Well, those powers that be seek the attempt to end the imperialist conflict here in Ireland 25 years ago as a means to humanize those responsible for inhuman acts. If you ever wanted a visual representation of the realities of the Good Friday Agreement, then consider us standing here today, a gathering of anti-imperialists on the streets while imperialist scum sit behind us behind the locked doors of Queen's University. The Good Friday Agreement was never about ending violence. It was only about ending violence directed at the state. For the violence of poverty, the violence of homelessness, the violence of con conflict related trauma, mental illness and suicide continues unabated. The state only cared about ending violence that it experienced and not cared one bit about the violence suffered day and daily by the people and has inflicted upon us the capitalist economic system when they oppose this in Ireland. Where is our peace process? More have died from suicide since 1998 than died as a result of three decades or more before it. Where was there a peace process? The six counties per capita is now the most dangerous place in Europe for women. Where exactly is there a peace process? It is absolutely no co coincidence that since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, the six counties has become a haven for global capitalism. It is no coincidence either that houses have more than doubled and with that the rents have skyrocketed alongside a new landlord class. Neither is it a coincidence that the six county state 
is now heavily involved in the mass production of weapons of war and other materials for sale and supply the imperialist armies across the globe. Stormwood government bodies have in recent years have gone as far as compiling documentation to be distributed to those who would seek the benefit from the six counties' roles in, in weapons production. FSDNI, the producers of this documentation, provide significant detail of the capabilities of the state when it comes to the production of war. Whether it is shipbuilding for Britain's MOD, missile production for Britain's war machine, or the development and manufacture of chipsets and guidance for weapon systems, the six counties' capabilities when it comes to the production of war materials is now the envy of many states worldwide. And that's before we even talk about the unmanned drones, composite materials and software. Indeed, and on the ending web with defence contractors wrapped up in the, display, in the supply and manufacture of war materials spans these six counties. Those materials produced on occupied territory and then are supplied for the use of global conflicts by militaries with long histories of human rights abuses. It is without a doubt that six counties has witnessed significant economic growth since the Good Friday Agreement. All the leading economists say so. Indeed, recent reports, reports suggest that the GDP a measure of goods and services in the state has more than doubled since 1998. Some of those leading economists have also stated that this growth has not benefited everyone. And this is born into the fact that before the cost of living crisis kicked in, over 300,000 across the state were now living in poverty. That's one in five people. And not a significant change since the signing of the agreement. Over 100,000 of them are children. Examining these facts, we now understand what the Good Friday Agreement was aimed at achieving. It was an attempt by the British state to end violence directed towards its presence in Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement would create a scenario where British businesses would benefit from a highly educated workforce at significantly lower overheads. The housing market would develop and transfer significant public housing resources into private hands alongside a new landlord class. Finance capital would flood the state, leading greater profits from investment portfolios. The six county state would become a global PO box for international conglomerates and effective banana republic of sorts allowing the wise and the great streams of money with low taxation. Huge amounts of state investment and infrastructure and private enterprise would help create this, create this dream scenario. Capitalism has got everything it needed from the Good Friday Agreement. The rest of us have had to foot, fight tooth and nail to survive the barren landscape that's left in its wake. We who suffer the daily violence of the capitalist society that they have foisted upon us, have set aside, have, we have been set aside from the peace process because we were never part of it anyway. This so-called peace process does not belong to us, so let them have it. If they want to use this peace process as a, as a means to wash war criminals, that's exactly what they'll do. Standing outside of that process, we will chart a different path. On that path, we will stand where we have always stood, on the side of the oppressed peoples of the world, on the side of justice and on the side of national liberation, and on the side of the common socialist republic that will bring an end to imperialism. Belfast says no to war criminals. Ireland says no to more criminals. Forget about it.